So what I'd like to do is uh, ask our panelists to come up as we begin to ask uh, Connie some questions. And the panelists now are Dr. Josephine Briggs from NIH, uh, Annie Patel, uh, and Isabel Peretz, who were, gave us such terrific lectures yesterday. And I'd also like to introduce uh, Arnold Steinhardt, who's here with the Chamber Music Festival. Many of you know him as the first violinist and founder of the Guarneri String Quartet. Arnold, it's wonderful to have you back here at Santa Fe. Thank you so much. And I'd like to introduce Lisa Wong. Many of you have heard Lisa, who will talk tomorrow. Lisa is a pediatrician and a musician and also uh, the president of the Longwood Symphony Orchestra. And Connie, why don't you stay up there too? We'll bring a chair up there if there aren't enough. Do we need another chair? I think we're okay. So one of the questions I have uh, builds on Connie's comment about Alzheimer's and maybe Michael or Peter or Gottfried can talk about that. So we've seen video examples, particularly yesterday and a little bit through Connie's presentation today, that music is a way to trigger memory in an Alzheimer's patient. And so maybe Peter or Godfrey, do we know, um, if they, are they here? I'm not sure. They, do we know in an Alzheimer's patient with progressive dementia, can you actually, you know, your talk this morning blew my mind because we talked about plasticity in the brain yesterday and reprogramming. But to see those physical <clears throat> changes in the imaging studies were just dramatic. So if you want an image of, you know, the ability to rebuild the brain, you showed us that through your therapeutic interventions. Can you really do that in an Alzheimer's setting? What's happening, as Connie said, when you're going back to an Alzheimer's patient and playing that music from their teenage years and they can begin to sing along, can you actually, through repetitive intervention, create a rewiring or a reprogramming in an Alzheimer's brain, or is that just a for-the-moment experience? So where's the science on that? Are we actually structuring scientific studies to look at that? I'm just very curious, since that's been a recurring theme for us. Do you want to address that, Godfrey? Um, I mean, I can certainly make some comments about this. I, I find um, Alzheimer's as one example of a neurodegenerative disease um, certainly challenging. I think one thing we shouldn't forget is that Alzheimer's is certainly different from stroke. Stroke is usually one-time injury, and from that time of the injury, the brain starts to recover, and we can use the rest of the brain to engage and see if we can remodel this. Alzheimer's and all of the other neurodegenerative disorders are continuous degenerative disorders. There is continuous loss of neurons. So although there are all these effects that we might see with music and we might elicit memories and we might be able to engage them, the underlying disease will progress. Um, and as long as we don't find, so like a cure or something that would actually halt the underlying disease, it will still be then difficult to see what the role of music is besides, you know, trying to engage with that patient um, at that state where they currently are. But I don't think that we should at this point think of, of music that it would potentially be rehabilitative for that disorder because you know, all that we know is that this will be a progressive disorder. Certainly if we talk about the classical Alzheimer's dementia. <laughs> Do we have that? However, however oh, sorry. Wow. Um, however, if you engage people with Alzheimer's in meaningful activities that they can do, um, like playing an instrument, like singing, like cooking, whatever, um, certain skills can be maintained longer. And so there's the hope in early Alzheimer's um, and dementia by engaging them in singing groups and these types of programs that, because music, as we heard this weekend, engages so many areas of the brain that we have a way of enriching or at least sustaining some of that function hopefully for a longer period of time. Thank you. So I think what we'd like to do is what we did successfully yesterday, which was sort of move down our panel and ask each of our panelists to give some thoughts from the presentations this morning and then let you begin to ask uh, questions of the panelists or any of the speakers. So Josie, you want to start? Uh, 
Uh, sure. Again, a really wonderful morning. Uh, I, I do have a few thoughts about the overall meeting, it, but I first of all want to say that this is very much this wonderful work we heard this morning uh, on the application of these methods in the neurological disorders is, is very much outside my own personal area of expertise. Uh, but I'm very impressed at the way in which we are seeing the synergism between a fundamental mechanistic understanding uh, and the therapeutic interventions. Uh, the work on, that, uh, on neuroplasticity uh, is a very uh, impressive example. And it is very difficult to design randomized clinical trials that show a benefit. The more one understands the mechanism by which the intervention may be working, even if that understanding is incomplete, the better chance one has to capture with sufficiently sensitive measures the, the way in which it may be working. Uh, <coughs> The, there is another thing that's been a, a theme in this meeting, is the value that uh, some of these very well-documented anecdotes have had. Um, Connie's uh, and Oliver Sachs's work is, is a wonderful example. Of the, uh, so were the dancing cockatoos. Um, <laughs> the, these uh, ends of one experiments are, are not viewed uh, by rigorous scientists or policymakers as definitive, but they can be informative if they are very carefully observed and if uh, the potential biases of the, the observers are, are, are carefully controlled for. Um, I, I am, think that the two areas we've seen here today are motor disorders and, and um, and stroke particularly, do carry some lessons for uh, the application of music therapy in other domains, like, for example, an area that interests me a, a lot, pain management. But the more in which we can get some good uh, hypotheses about how a music intervention might alter pain processing pathways, I think the more likely we are to get some informative and definitive uh, answers. One thing that one needs to always think about when you uh, plan studies of this sort is, why do we need this answer? What, who is the, uh, what is it, af what are we really after? Uh, there was discussion yesterday of how we might ever know whether the changes in, br in the brain of, of musicians are nature versus nurture. Well, that's one kind of question. There's an old other kind of question, shall we implement this therapy in every clinic in the country? That sort of health policy. Those are very different uh, kinds of experiments, and it's very helpful to, to have thought about that. But certainly a lot of the work uh, in the therapeutic areas is uh, important for health policy making. And, and one thing that I would mention that I've thought of in several of the contexts of this study is, is sometimes the benefits for some of this therapy may be benefits for caretakers as well as for the patient. And that we haven't seen captured very often. So those are just a collection of some random thoughts of uh, continued very stimulating presentations. Thank you. I just want to also say how much I enjoyed the uh, presentations this morning, and um, rather than sort of summarize, uh, I thought I would uh, ask a couple of questions. So is, uh, is, is uh, Michael here? Yeah. In the back, oh, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, so you, you said the temporal structure of rhythm can override or replace faulty codes for movement control. That was one of the things that you said, and I, was, I found that very interesting. Do you, what do you think, which one is it? Do you think that um, music is sort of normalizing the defective circuit, or do you think it's working around the defective circuit and using a completely different pathway in these patients when you see them walk to the beat? Uh, <coughs> uh, we, are not, we don't know for sure what it is, but I think it's probably, a, it, uh, it depends on the, lead, the type of lesion, it depends on the diagnosis. Um, I think stroke patients are capable of learning you know, they need to have the correct learning strategy. So yeah. rhythmic auditory stimulation is probably, or PSE or whatever, which technique we use is probably facilitating a proper learning strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, in Parkinson's disease, we may actually be looking at a uh, maybe alternative circuitry, et cetera. So that really depends on the diagnosis, I think. Huh, okay, all right. And the other thing is, since we have 
Gottfried and Isabel in the same room, which doesn't happen that often. Um, I would, uh, Gottfried, you had this interesting comment about how uh, even if a patient doesn't show differential abilities in speaking and singing words, uh, it still may be that through melodic intonation therapy they recover more spontaneous speech than they would through some other form of therapy. And I thought that was an interesting observation. And I wondered, um, since you guys have somewhat dif discrepant findings in terms of the ability to speak and sing words, that that might be a potential uh, resolution, that, that maybe it's not differential at outset, but the use of music can still have um, a beneficial effect on language production. Yeah, <clears throat> I can agree with this. Um, and what I was trying to show is that <clears throat> we still try to, try to actually get data, both at, in the acute phase at the patient's bedside as well as so like all of our chronic patients at baseline to see what their singing and speaking abilities are at baseline, whether or not there is a dissociation. Um, at this point, um, I think we have individual samples, such as the patient that I show, who shows a very clear difference. There are also patients that do not have this. Um, but even those ones that do not have this seem to benefit from the intervention. So I think, I, I would actually not say that there is a, there's a disagreement or a different finding with what, what Isabel has, um, has put out. Um, I, I just, I think we need to assess whether or not this test of finding this dissociation at baseline or at bedside mm -hmm. um, is a good indicator or predictor how well they, they respond to therapy. That, that is still mm -hmm. something that needs to be determined. Mm -hmm. I think where the differences sometimes arise is, you know, would all kinds of aphasic disorders um, um, benefit from this? And I would say that it is most likely that only those aphasic disorders that have a strong speech motor problem mm -hmm. will probably benefit the most. Um, but maybe also those aphasic disorders that have a problem with actually hearing themselves speak mm -hmm. um, and monitoring what they're speaking because mm -hmm. MIT, by slowing things down very significantly, so like enhances that detection of auditory feedback. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly would not work in patients that have Wernicke's aphasia and also not work in patients that have severe global aphasia, although the the categorization of these patients is certainly a little bit different from studies to studies. Mm -hmm. And then one other point that I think is important, <clears throat> and I think Isabel showed some data for this as well in the dementia study, that I think interventions have to be done very, very intensely for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, to try to teach a 75-year-old patient to now all of a sudden use much more the right hemisphere for vocal output really requires some intense training. Mm. You know, I mean, how long does it take for any one of us to master a musical piece? Mm. We don't do that necessarily in, you know, 75 or 100 hours. Mm. I always tell patients, even if they graduate from the, from the immediate treatment study that this is a lifelong right. thing that they're gonna have to do. Yeah. We have taught them the tricks yeah. and have given them tips on how to do it, right. but they will have to continue to practice this. Right, so it's, it's not like an orthopedic treatment, it's a, like going to music school. Mm -hmm. yes. Did you wanna say anything? Does Isabel have, uh, yeah. no, no, do I you disagree? No, no, I uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I think we, we come to an agreement now. I mean, for the people uh, in the audience, uh, it has been on for a few years now that we have uh, conflicting data sets uh, from the onset in the sense that what I was uh, describing and reporting in publications is that it was a kind of a myth that uh, aphasic patients, the ones who have a uh, uh, expressive disorder uh, could really pronounce words while singing but not while speaking. And that was really a classical teaching. And so we questioned that uh, claim by using, I think, uh, a more appropriate and more controlled condition that is to compare the, 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 
speaking mode and the singing mode in the same conditions because what neurologists were seeing was really at the bedside uh, it was just that the, per the, the, the aphasic could sing but no longer sp spoke. But of course, I mean, it's very different because as we have discussed yesterday, it's uh, singing, usually it's uh, uh, something that is automatic, highly associated, uh, coming from uh, overland, from uh, old memories, etc. Like we, we had that exercise with the Coney uh, this morning as well. I mean, we know all this is highly associated, it's automatic, even while sleeping, I think we would be able to complete those words. And that's what they were seeing in the clinic, but it was kind of impressive because those patients could express themselves. And I think that's a very important point, that music allows these patients to express themselves vocally. And, uh, and that was, I think, my point, is that the emotional and uh, uh, aspect of this possibility for these patients is huge. However, what I'm saying that the cost, I mean, to, to use this way to, to speak, um, in my personal uh, um, uh, studies, is too high. Uh, I mean, it's extremely costly uh, in terms of time, effort, and my feeling that if, I mean, uh, of course, we heard success stories. Uh, the story I was telling yesterday about dementia is not as successful. I mean, we do show that over time, over three months of intensive re repetition of singing, they do show an advantage of singing <coughs> over speaking. But is it really, really worthwhile? That's the question we may ask. But what I really want to um, emphasize now while uh, as a comment, a general comment, that we really need evidence-based um, studies. And I'd like to congratulate uh, Gottfried, who is really the, the first one to, uh, to do this kind of research, which is extremely, extremely uh, time consuming and also uh, expensive. I'm glad to hear that you got some more funds for the uh, um, the other part of uh, the study with autism. But my point is, it's a little bit more technical. If, if we want to, to have evidence-based kind of um, uh, strategy uh, for music therapy or for music intervention in general, and also to justify part of what we are doing in the labs, uh, because that's really the implication of this kind of discussion, is that it motivates us to, to, to understand the mechanisms uh, and that's really the point. For example, what is, and I think we addressed a little bit yesterday, and I like just to, to throw the, the, the question. Uh, I have thought about that uh, uh, in another studies. What is really the good control condition? Um, you, you have a very nice uh, control condition in your studies, but in many studies, it's very difficult to find what is really the, con the, the, the condition that would be the best control. Um, I had the opportunity to participate to a large-scale study, uh, and we didn't mention that study yet in Finland. And it has, I mean, may, maybe many of you have heard about it. It was uh, the first author is uh, Sarkamo. You mentioned that mm -hmm. study, maybe. Not here. Oh, not here, okay. And um, I, I just want to, 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 to tell you the story. It's a departure point, but it is evidence-based kind of design. Uh, so I, I, I'll tell you the, the design, what it is. Uh, they just randomly selected patients, uh, 60 patients, and uh, to three conditions. In one condition, they had to listen to uh, the music they like, uh, every day for 30 minutes, I think. The, in another condition, it was, and, and we discussed a lot about this control condition. What should it be? Because they only, at, the, at the start, they only considered music, music listening and uh, uh, the regular therapy, of course. They were going through the regular therapy for uh, their uh, problems, uh, but uh, was, so it was kind of silence so or nothing. And then we discussed and uh, we came up with, a, and I think it's a nice control condition, it was to, to listen to stories. 
So you know those stories that are recorded for the blind people, they are, it's extremely well done. Uh, it's uh, full of life, it's rich, and so uh, they compare, so that was the second condition, it was to story listening, and of course the third condition was doing nothing special on the top of the regular therapy. And the results were really um, striking, that is after three months and six months, I mean it's really, I mean, they were devoted. It was a huge team uh, that was involved in that study, which was published in Brain in 2008, if you want to have a look at that study, with tons of measurements, because it was a kind of fishing expedition, mm -hmm. because uh, we, I mean, some of us had some idea of what kind of mechanisms should be really uh, um, improved or not by these different kind of interventions. But it doesn't matter. I mean, there were a few improvements in a few tests, and, uh, and for me, the major outcome was really the change on the depression scales. That the, on all the kind of mood scales they, they, they <coughs> use, they use many, several, and uh, what was really striking that the group who listened to music regularly uh, really rated their uh, w wellness and their quality of life as much higher in general than the ones, the, the group who was uh, listening to uh, stories. And, uh, and that's what I think is critical and was trying to con con convince uh, you yesterday that this is really uh, what I think we should measure better. It's uh, the, the, these social, emotional uh, engagement effects. Uh, that are so important. So that was my comment after this morning session as well. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. We're all here um, talking about the great power of music and the great power of music in helping patients. But um, I'm just thinking, um, what about all of us before we become patients, what about all of us <laughs> who, uh, who just go through life and receive music and um, music therapy, you know? And I, I'm thinking especially of the privileged position that um, musicians have receiving hours and hours of music therapy all day long, every day. And uh, I can think of one of my first uh, reactions to music when I was maybe four or five years old. My parents had a record collection. And I remember hearing the Beethoven Violin Concerto and um, crying, you know, crying not with sadness, but with some kind of, actually it was rather a frightening feeling because it, it, it unlocked things that I did not know existed in me. And not long after that, I started studying the violin. Um, not long after that, I began to play melodies which I found very, very beautiful, like Row, Row Your Boat, or Drink to Me Only With Thine Eyes, which I still think is extraordinarily beautiful. And, uh, and, and then by the time I was a teenager, I was involved with some pretty great music, and by my late teen years and, and my um, early adult years, I was involved Involved with some of the great masterpieces of music that were actually worlds unto themselves, you know, with with great complexity and great depth of feeling, and and uh, then as a as a emerging professional mus musician, I got to um, delve into these masterpieces um, <coughs> night and day. You know, I, th this whole thing reminds me of uh, not only the fullness of, of music and its power over us, but the, the emptiness of life without uh, music. And there was a New Yorker cartoon, it must have been easily 25 or 30 years ago, uh, that showed a desolate back alley with just a few empty bottles and cans strewn about. And uh, the caption was, Life Without Mozart. And a lot of people, you know, um, responded to that. I saw that on a lot of refrigerators and um, a, a lot of desks. And so we musicians um, have had life with Mozart and Beethoven and Prokofiev and on and on and on. And it's been, you know, an incredible 
privilege and a richness, and I, I would ask <coughs> the scientists, um, are we better off <laughs> in avoiding being patients later on in life? Uh, um, are we more, um, are we less susceptible to depression? Are we um, less susceptible to things like Alzheimer's? I ask that, of course, for very selfish reasons. <laughs> but um, those are questions. I, I'm, I'm sure there are studies done on this, many studies, but I haven't heard of them. I'd be very interested in anybody's comments on the Maybe subject. Godfrey will. <laughs> So, so there, there are actually a few studies that have been published um, on this, not prospectively, um, but um, so like correlation studies who basically just have looked at the amount of activities that, that people would do. So the more activities you do, the more, the more enriched your environment is. Um, and that might include um, musical activities, singing, dancing, playing chess, you know, meeting friends and all this kind of stuff. So the more you have of this, the better your aging is, the better it is for your brain health. Um, there are several studies that have been published over the last 10 years or so. And um, there was actually a very recent study, I cannot remember right now where this was published, that looked at this also, again, correlation. I think it came from somewhere in in the south of the U.S., but um, we, we still have to do, you know, prospective studies that, let's say, would randomize retirees into, you know, different kinds of activities to really show does music making, in comparison to other activities, have some sort of more neuroprotective or mood stabilizing effect. Um, I think those are interesting questions. There's actually a workshop, I think, in September that's been organized by um, the National Endowment for the Arts, where some of these questions are actually going to be um, addressed. Thank you. I, I just had um, one experience that I'd like to relate when, to my surprise, I administered music to myself as, as, as a healing agent. And that um, was on 9-11. <coughs> Excuse me. And I and my family and a couple of friends were in the Sierra Nevada. And on that particular day, um, we wanted to climb one of these great peaks that had this fantastic view on the top. And most of us left. My wife stayed in camp with a friend and uh, oblivious to the fact that just at that moment, the, the World Trade Towers had actually been attacked. And uh, my wife and her friend just by chance had a transistor radio. You know, this was in the middle of nowhere. And they, they, they heard the horrible news. And uh, we came back down and uh, my wife told us what had happened and we were aghast. We couldn't believe that a plane could actually make a building come down. But in, in, more than that, I, I think for the first time in my life, um, I had this, strange sense of complete insecurity. Um, I realized then how safe we are as Americans here and uh, how privileged we are, how blessed we are. And we haven't had a war on our, on our land since the Civil War. And so um, I not only had you know, this terrible feeling of uncertainty for, for the present, but for the future, what was going to be um, the future of our country and for my family and for me. And uh, I had the feeling that the ground had been pulled out from under me. And without even knowing what I was doing, rather sleepwalking, I walked to our tent and took out a practice violin that I had brought along because I had some concerts coming up. And uh, I walked to the stream nearby where we used to bathe every morning uh, with my violin, and I played Bach for myself as a way of restoring my sanity, you know, uh, this well-ordered and inspirational music, miraculous music of Bach, 
really helped me to begin to put my life together in, 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 in the face of this extraordinary tragedy that was happening t to us. So, you know, I, I, as a musician, I, I have the sense that we're involved in something very rich and complex, and yes, sometimes even that we are in a service profession, you know, along with doctors and priests, but here I was delivering uh, the medicine to myself. It's hard to follow after that. <laughs> but but um, it does bring back to me, uh, we're at a such an interesting intersection, and I am so grateful that we have this conference. We have the neuroscientists who are you know, telling us what is happening in our brains anatomically, and we can see also physiologically we're hearing what is happening to our autonomic ner nervous system. I don't think it, it diminishes the fact that music itself is something that's um, that's universal, and it's beyond that. There's so much more deep history to, to music. The fact that we're trying to figure out how it works now does not diminish the power of um, the music at all. And I think, Isabel, what you're talking about just recently has been a thought that's been coming to me, which is one of the things about music and bringing the arts and sciences back together is that we're at a very, very interesting intersection where um, I think pure medical studies do not give us the full answer, and pure social studies or humanism studies will not give us the full answer. It's going to have to be a balance. And in fact, are we now trying to create a new paradigm, a new research paradigm? Um, I know there's a lot of neuroscience articles about music, but yet, on the other hand, there are also articles in the arts and health journals and new journals that are coming up, and humanism journals, arts education journals, Everybody has got a piece of it, but I think music is just so, so broad that it is tying all of these things together. So just a couple of thoughts that came up um, to my mind during this whole conference. One of them uh, was what Gottfried was, and Cheryl actually were getting my mind around, which is, um, Gottfried, you said that there may be a, a neuroprotective effect to, to music, and does it protect us from having strokes? And Cheryl, your, your response was just, is there, is there new vascularization, vascularization because there is a thicker arcuate fasciculus on both sides? We don't know that, but it's, I mean, you're speaking as an oncologist and you think about those things. And that was, that, that's, that could be something that is really true, which brings me back to, as a pediatrician, asking two questions, which is, one is music education again, one of the most important things in our um, children's lives that we're neglecting, and two, is that preventive medicine for the future. You know, uh, I've helped Harold Varmus, the head of the National Cancer Institute, in a thing called provocative questions, right? So if we're gonna spend money, what's the most important question to answer in cancer? And I think, one of the things we wanted to do in the symposium is think about what are the most important questions. So I want to throw out a provocative question to you all. And yesterday, one of the things that really struck me were some of Ani's examples, and I think a couple of other speakers, about if you play music to children, they become more cooperative, yeah? So we saw examples of more constructive play together or even the autistic child being willing to help and lift up a pencil to a therapist because they heard music. So this will sound very sexual, but one of the things that we still don't understand in medicine is why women who work together develop the same menstrual cycles. So they synchronize. So we know that there has to be something about a social environment that changes the physiologic chemistry of that group of individuals who are together. I don't know that we know how to measure it. We've speculated there are pheromones, there are things we all secrete that we don't understand, that odors are very important, and that's a very early science, but fantastically genetically based and increasingly understood. And it makes me wonder whether music, the act of hearing music or moving to music, creates either an energetic synchronization in the brain or the secretion of 
autonomic physiologic substances that we don't yet know that create a more harmonious environment. So it, they're great questions to think about, and it makes me think about what you said, Lisa. Does that mean that you, and we're gonna get into this tomorrow in our session, that these phenomenon of listening and playing music can create harmony, can improve social interactions. We saw very clear examples of that yesterday that I thought were quite compelling. So I don't know if you want to respond to that, but your thought about prevention in children I think is very powerful. Well, I, I think I've, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about this for many, many years. Um, the orchestra that I work with, Longwood Symphony, is um, almost all healthcare professionals, but we're not unique. There are healthcare um, and medical orchestras all over the world, and there are at least 15 or 20 in our own country. Um, but around this room, um, most of us had musical training as children and, and, and maybe continuing to be playing now, and we are all here thinking about healing and and helping other people. Um, there aren't that many lawyers' orchestras. Um, <laughs> but, but, but music and healing, even in, the Greek, in Greek mythology, music and healing have always been tied together. And I think it is the giving of ourselves to give music outward. It's, it's, a, social, it's a social thing. It's a way to express, and you can't, you know, playing by yourself is never nearly as good as playing for others and playing with others. Um, and I think that that whole, that, that leads to all of that. Connie, you want to give us some closing comments for the morning? And Arnold, thank you for those, sharing those very personal and beautiful comments. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that we're talking about is um, can music help us stay well? And I, and I think... From the clinical side, we see how it can help improve people who've lost function. And you can imagine, um, and we do experience the healing power of music in our own work with ourselves, as you said. And, and to just carry that forward, you know, to bring that back to your communities and work with those educators, the school districts that are cutting back and, and say how important it is that everybody have access to music and making music, and that it's crucial for our existence. Just a small point to um, bring together so much of what has been said. If you look at this from an evolutionary perspective, music did not develop one person by him or herself. It was always a communal activity, and it also involved always physical activity. If you look at members of an orchestra, or of any of us who, who play even poorly, let alone you professionals, there is always physical activity. And that is one of the reasons that, by and large, musicians live longer than others, conductors live longer than others, because they have the physical activity component. But I am especially drawn to the evolutionary concept of how the, the, all cultures, every culture in the world, from the beginning of humankind, developed some kind of communal noise making which became what we know as music. Thanks. Thank you, Barry. Well, I want to thank all the speakers and the panelists for this morning. And we're going to break for lunch and be back here promptly at 1230.